we'll cover the chemical equilibrium section in the chemistry syllabus. So first of all, we need to know that in order for an equilibrium to be reached, we need a reversible reaction. So as shown here, where we have compounds X, Y, plus another ingredient in this mixture, which we've called Z. This reaction will have a forward reaction labeled by the top arrow, where we have X, Y plus Z forming Y, Z plus X. That would be your forward reaction. This bottom arrow refers to a reverse reaction in which Y, Z plus X will give you X, Y plus Z. So you have these two ingredients, which in the forward reaction produce these, and in the reverse reaction, these two ingredients will produce these two. Now, an important concept to know for this section is the difference between an open and a closed system. Equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, can only be achieved in a closed system. As soon as you have an open system, you cannot achieve chemical equilibrium. Now, an open system is one in which both energy and matter can be exchanged between the system and its surroundings. Whereas a closed system is a system in which mass is conserved inside the system, but energy can enter or leave the system freely. freely. Now, chemical e equilibrium can only be established in a system that is closed, one in which mass is conserved, so there's no loss of mass or gain in mass, However, energy can enter or leave the system freely. In some instances, they may try and confuse you or trick you into believing that a saturated solution may be an open system. However, a saturated solution is considered a closed system. Now, dynamic equilibrium, there are three things that we know about dynamic equilibrium. Firstly, it only takes place in a closed system. Secondly, the rate of the forward and the reverse reaction are equal. That means that in this equation over here, the rate at which this is produced, the rate at which this forward reaction produces this is equal to the rate at which this reaction, this reverse reaction takes place to produce this. Then we move on to approaching dynamic equilibrium. Now, if we take an example such as this, where we have H2 plus I2 to produce 2HI, and the reverse reaction where we have 2HI broken down into H2 plus I2, here we have a forward reaction and here we have a reverse reaction. Now, as we approach dynamic equilibrium, it will take place as follows. Firstly, we have H2 and I2 are placed in a container. So we have our two ingredients here placed in a container. Initially, there is no HI. So initially, only the forward reaction can take place. Only H2 plus I2 can form HI. Because there is no HI initially, therefore the reverse reaction cannot take place. As the reaction takes place, it produces HI, as we can see here. The concentration of H2 and I2 decrease, and therefore the rate of the forward reaction decreases. Now that, that comes from your chemical rates of reaction, which will be explained in another lesson. However, it makes sense that if your H2 concentration and your I2 concentration decrease, there are fewer H2 and I2 molecules in your container Therefore, there are fewer successful collisions and therefore your rate of reaction decreases. Your concentration of HI increases as more HI is produced and therefore your reverse reaction rate increases. Because you now have a higher concentration of HI, there are a greater number of successful collisions and therefore the rate of reaction increases. In this process, equilibrium is eventually reached as your rate of your reverse reaction increases to a point where it is equal to the rate of your forward reaction, which decreases until they are both equal. 
both products and reactants are present. So you will have H2 and I2 present as well as HI present. And the concentration of your HI in your container as well as your H2 and I2 will remain constant. It is also good to note that that does not mean that the concentration of H2, I2 and HI will be the same. It just means that the concentration of each will remain constant and will not change. So some notes when we look at dynamic equilibrium. So equilibrium is dynamic. It does not stop. So your forward reaction will continue and your reverse reaction will continue. They do not stop when you reach equilibrium. Equilibrium is in a closed system. As we've said before, it cannot occur in an open system and concentrations remain constant as I've just said. Next, it is important to look at Le Chatelier's principle when we look at equilibrium. So if external chain conditions are changed, the system will shift to a new equilibrium. So there are a number of factors which we can change in order to shift that equilibrium. And for the purpose of chemistry and matric, you will need to know how to identify these disturbances, what these disturbances will affect and how the equilibrium will shift. So the factors that will, that will change the equilibrium are concentration, pressure, but pressure is only when your reactants are in a gas form and temperature. Now, when you answer questions with regard to Le Chatelier's principle, there's a very specific way that these questions need to be answered in order to cover every aspect of the question and get the marks that you want to get. So steps when answering these questions. Firstly, you must identify this disturbance. So if the disturbance is that there's an increase in temperature, you must state that an increase in temperature will do the following. Next, you must state that the system will oppose the disturbance. So you must say with an increase in temperature, the system will, by Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium point will shift so as to oppose the change in temperature. Then you must state whether the forward or reverse reaction is favored. In this example, with temperature, you will need to know which is exothermic and which is endothermic, which we will cover and then you will decide if the equilibrium shifts left or whether it shifts right and you must state that and then simply to end off you must discuss the result if the equilibrium shift favors the forward reaction you must state that the concentration of the forward reaction product will increase and so on so it's very specific to each question but you must follow these this outline in order to answer every aspect now, when we look at a disturbance in concentration, say we have reactants A plus B producing C and D, and the reverse produces A plus B. An increase in concentration, the equilibrium will shift to lower the concentration. So, for instance, say we increase the concentration of reactant A. By increasing that, the equilibrium will shift to favor the forward reaction so that we decrease the concentration of A. However, we must note that the concentration of pure solids and liquids cannot change. By adding more solid, the concentration does not increase. In many questions, they will try and trick you and say, if we add a solid reactant called X, what will happen to the equilibrium point? Discuss this using Le Chatelier's principle. The answer is simply that the equilibrium point will not shift as the concentration has not changed because you've added a solid and this, the concentration of a solid cannot be changed. The same thing with a liquid, if they were to say that a liquid is added. When we look at pressure, an increase in pressure favors the reaction which produces the smaller number of moles. Say we have a reaction where your forward reaction produces four moles of gas and your reverse reaction produces two moles of gas and we increase the pressure. In this reaction, it would favor the reverse reaction because you want to produce the side, you want to produce the side that has fewer number of moles. In this reaction, the reverse reaction produces two moles, while the forward reaction produces four moles. Therefore, an increase in pressure, you would favor the reverse reaction to produce two moles. 
The opposite would be true if you were to decrease the pressure. It would aim to produce a side with more moles and therefore it would favor the forward reaction. It's good to note that this is only applicable to gases. If you are given reactants that are not in gas form, then an increase or decrease in pressure will not affect the equilibrium point. When we increase temperature or change our temperature, a temperature increase favors the endothermic reaction to lower the temperature. A temperature decrease favors the exothermic reaction to raise the heat of the, of the reaction. Note an increase in temperature will increase both the forward and the reverse reaction. This is by principle of your rates of reaction. By increasing temperature, you increase your kinetic energy and thereby you increase the number of successful collisions, which increases your rate of reaction. Therefore, both the rates of reaction will be increased. But one being the endothermic reaction, because it's favored by a temperature increase, will initially favor be favored more due to the fact that the equilibrium point shifts to favor the endothermic reaction. It is also very common for them to ask you how does a catalyst affect the equilibrium point of a reaction. You must know that a catalyst does not affect the position of the equilibrium. It only alters the activation energy, which does not affect the equilibrium point. Then we have equilibrium constants, which we use to identify whether the reaction favors the forward or the reverse reaction. Now, the equilibrium constant is represented by Kc, and it's equal to the concentration of your products over your concentration of your reactants at equilibrium. You must know that your equilibrium constant is not affected by pressure or concentration. It is only affected by temperature. So if they were to give you an equilibrium constant before a pressure change and ask you what would happen to the equilibrium constant after a pressure change, your answer would be that there is no change. Same would be true of concentration. However, if they were to increase or decrease the temperature, your equilibrium constant will change. As shown here, your equilibrium constant would be your concentration of your NH3. And because they are, your ratio is 2 NH3, you square it. You must always remember that your ratio is your exponent. So 3H2, your 3 is now your exponent on your H2. And obviously where you're given values, your concentration would then be substituted in for each element of the reaction. These are your concentrations at equilibrium and not while you're approaching equilibrium. You must only use your concentrations at equilibrium to work out your equilibrium constant. If they ever ask you for the equilibrium constant of the reverse reaction, it is simply one over Kc because you will simply have your H2 and N2 in your numerator and your NH3 in your denominator, which will simply give you one over your Kc. If your Kc is greater than one, it is normally said that, that your reaction favors your forward reaction and there's a greater concentration of products. If your Kc is less than one, it is said that the reaction favors your reverse reaction and there's a greater concentration of reactants. Note that solids and pure liquids are excluded from your equilibrium constant. So in this equation over here, if you were to have a, a liquid or a solid, say you had a solid in your products, you would not include that in your equilibrium constant. You will exclude it and only include those that are not solids or pure liquids. Now in this section, a very handy method to calculate your equilibrium constants, your concentrations, your initial concentrations is the rice table. Now you set it up as follows your reaction. So you would obviously write out your reaction, your initial concentration. They will give you normally give you some of your initial concentrations and your products will normally be, normally be zero because you have not produced any products. Your change, they will normally give you an equilibrium concentration and you'll be able to work out your change. And 
through this method, you will be able to then work out all of your unknowns and your equilibrium constant. This will be covered in one of our chemistry questions and answers lessons. So keep an eye out on that and we will go through examples of how to use the rice table and where to apply it and where it may make it easier to work out your equilibrium constant.